go. Oops, sorry. Uh, right, so my first slide is just a brief overview about um, the Wildlife Trust's role in planning. Um, so you may have gathered by now that as a Wildlife Trust, we engage with um, the planning sector um, to try and benefit wildlife. Um, and just broadly, this falls into um, seeking to influence local plans. Um, we respond to some planning decisions to try and get better outcomes for wildlife. Um, and we'll also work with partners to plan strategically for nature's recovery, um, as well as trying to inspire and empower local communities to stand up for their local natural environment. And we've got quite a lot of advice um, on our website. So the link is at the bottom of that slide there. Um, so my um, talk now is on neighbourhood plans. Um, so hopefully as many of you are from parish councils you'll be aware of neighbourhood plans um, and some of you I'm sure will have some or might be working on them. Um, so the neighbourhood plans they came um, about as part of the 2011 Localism Act so they've been around for a, a while. Um, in essence they um, give communities the power to write a plan to shape development in their area um, that it has a statutory weight um, so it then has quite a high weight in decision making. Um, you should note that they must conform to the local plans and to national planning policy framework. Um, so they can't reduce housing um, allocations in an area, but you could increase it. Um, and you can also have a say about where that housing goes um, and you can increase the design standards um, for housing in your area. Um, so often neighbourhood plans um, get reviewed every five years. Um, so the next few slides are going to be about how you can use a neighbourhood plan um, for the benefit of wildlife. And um, so hopefully even those of you that have neighbourhood plans, and I'm sure some of them will be fantastic for wildlife, um, there might be some points that when you get around to reviewing it, um, you can perhaps make them even better. Um, so my first slide is about identifying um, the wildlife present in your area and this is really important. Um, I think most people when you ask them they might say that they like access to the countryside, um, they might say that they like hearing birdsong on their morning walk or seeing butterflies in their garden um, but trying to actually um, kind of make a list of what that means in terms of what features of your area um, are make, are leading it to have fantastic wildlife can be quite difficult. Um, so gathering this data, um, and you can often get most of this from your local record centre, um, you'd want to gather data on the kind of habitats that you have, um, any sites that might be designated either locally or nationally um, for nature conservation. Um, and you can also get um, species record data, so all the points on that map there um, would all be for a particular species that somebody has sent in a record um, so normally they're of note. Um, so that's a really good first step and even if you do that that can sometimes just help um, protect wildlife simply by lots of people realising that it's there in the first place. Um, my next key point is that via a neighbourhood plan you have the power to designate local green spaces um, so this is a, a designation that can be placed on a parcel of land that would then protect it from development. Um, so it does have to comply, the designation has to comply with what's written into national planning policy. And um, so I put the paragraph um, up on the screen there. But as you can see, as long as it is um, of particular significance to the community, um, it can be designated due to its wildlife um, richness. Um, so that is a really good um, thing to do in your neighbourhood plan is to try and designate local green spaces if you have spaces that are really good for wildlife. Um, so you, a neighbourhood plan it can also help guide development um, and this again can be really important um, especially if you've gathered um, a lot more um, local knowledge about the habitats and species um, in your area um, then perhaps the local planning um, authority so the council might have. Um, you can try and help guide development um, away from being allocated on sites that are really good for nature conservation um, and guide them to sites which are of less value to wildlife. Um, you might like to have an even uh, more in-depth look at how um, wildlife is using the landscape local to you. Um, I think this is an example, um, I think this was an Ascot um, neighbourhood plan where they've tried to pick out um, wildlife corridors, so particular routes that are really important to help wildlife move through the landscape. Um, these could be river or stream corridors, 
um, which facilitate the movement of, of quite a lot of species. Um, it could be dark um, tree or hedgerow corridors that bats use, um, or it could be, um, for example, I think Fiona mentioned having hedgehog holes um, in gardens. So it could even be down to kind of a street level of where hedgehogs have access um, to tracks of gardens and um, parks, for example. Um, so your neighbourhood plan, it can also stipulate what development must achieve. Um, so this is in, time, in terms of you can raise the design standards from what has been set out within the local plan. Um, so this slide gives you a list, it's not exhaustive, um, but essentially you could write policies um, to require any development in your area um, to achieve these um, examples which would be really beneficial to wildlife. Um, so examples could be retain existing trees and hedgerows on site. Um, you could specify a percentage tree canopy cover. So in Wickham, they say 25% tree canopy cover. Um, you could specify the types of planting that are used in landscape schemes to make sure they benefit um, insects and birds. Um, you can um, require them to use um, what are called sustainable drainage features um, and what's meant by this is where you get runoff from hard surfaces and buildings um, instead of it all going down into a drain underground you can use um, natural features um, such as rain gardens on properties or um, attenuation basins which are kind of like a pond to hold the water and they're far more valuable to wildlife whilst also functioning to drain um, water away. Um, and you could also require greater buffers. So if you have got a nature reserve in your area and there's likely to be a development next to it, you can require a large buffer to help protect um, an existing nature site. So those are just a few examples there. Um, another important thing that your plan can do is it can set out, um, I suppose, like an agreed vision for how you might like to enhance um, biodiversity and the natural environment in your area. Um, so you could have a look at, um, for example, like your parks or village greens, and you might like to put plant a wildflower meadow um, or put a pond in. Um, and I know some of the future webinars are going to cover some of these topics in a little bit more detail. Um, but by setting it out in your neighbourhood plan, you've kind of got that agreed shared vision for what you might like to do. Um, so this is my last slide now. Um, I've run through these quite quickly because I'm aware of time, but if you've got questions, please do um, put them in the comments. Um, so this is just a little bit of advice on plan making. So if you're at the stage of putting together a neighbourhood plan um, or revising a current one, these are some kind of key tips that would help to get um, wildlife and nature um, more heavily featured within the neighbourhood plan. Um, so the first one is setting up a specific natural environment group um, within the neighbourhood planning team. Um, and by having those people who are specifically tasked with looking at the natural environment can achieve um, much better outcomes um, than perhaps if it got jumbled up with all the other topics that you might also be having to consider as part of a neighbourhood plan. Um, Remembering to ask the community um, during consultations. I think I said earlier, a lot of people might use phrases like we like the countryside. Um, so obviously you don't want to lead people, but try and make sure that there is um, adequate opportunity for people to think about um, what it is about the natural environment that they like um, and to feed that back to you um, with, when you're consulting. Um, consulting your local records centre, so is your local biological record centre, and um, there's one covering it's Teaverk in Berkshire and Oxfordshire and Beemirk, Buckinghamshire and Milton Keynes local record centre um, in Bucks and Milton Keynes. Um, so they've got a whole wealth of data that they can provide you um, on habitats and species records in your area. Um, I just yeah, a little reminder um, that obviously wildlife doesn't comply to our kind of administrative boundaries. Um, so have a think about what there might be in the neighbouring neighbourhood areas um, to try and help things link up. So specific, especially if you're looking at wildlife corridors, that could be really useful. Um, and then encourage people within your community to record their own wildlife sightings, because you'll get a much better idea of what, what is actually around. Um, and then, yeah, just engage landowners early on um, look for sources of funding. So sometimes there are um, pots of money you can find to help you put together 
some of the, the mapping work I talked about earlier um, and look for local sources of expertise. So there, there are quite a few um, ecologists out there and you might just be lucky that you have an ecologist in your neighbourhood area that could perhaps either help or lead on some of this, on some of this work. Um, so that was a brief run through. There is loads more information available um, to help with neighbourhood plans on the web. Um, so there's some on our own VBOUTS website and we've got a neighbourhood plan um, advice leaflet that you can download, um, which has got much of what I've covered and, and more. Um, and then on other people's websites, there's a particularly good one on how to designate local green space. Um, online and then the government's got its own um, guidance as well on how to make a neighbourhood plan if you're at the initial stages. Um, so that is me, thank you Kate. Thanks very much Annie, that was fantastic. Um, so if you can stop sharing your screen and yep. I'm going to hand over to Councillor Jane McBean who's uh, Councillor for Buckinghamshire Council and Chesham Town Council. So are you okay, Jane, sharing your screen? Perfect. And you just need to unmute yourself. I was trying to unmute myself. <laughs> yeah, I think I've done it. I'm a complete yeah. technical dinosaur. Um, so Kate and the team thought it might be useful to have a counsellor here to um, just talk about how the, the kind of practical application of everything we've talked about, um, because some of it might seem a little kind of high level. Um, let's see if I can, oh, it's not going to change slides now. Let's have a look. Oh, there we go. Right, so um, so Chesham is the third largest town in Buckinghamshire. We've got a population of about 22, 22 and a half thousand people. Um, we're a very old town, date back to pre-Saxon times. We're completely surrounded by green belts, so we're quite confined. Um, we've got a big row going on in our local plan development about release of Greenbelt and we're also looking at brownfield sites and how we can um, increase development within the town. But it's become apparent that green space, biodiversity and the natural landscape is, is incredibly important to all of us as councillors and in particular our residents and especially so over the last year or so because of all of the um, media furore around climate change and the Extinction Rebellion and things like that. So one of the significant significant things for us was about four or five years ago we decided to get involved with the then Buckinghamshire County Council on the issue of devolved services so until that time we had very little control over land where well, we didn't have any control over land that the county council owned uh, they decided to devolve services down their tailored packages uh, much better local control so we now cut all the grass verges there's some minor um, tree management there's hedge management there are also other practical things like road sign cleaning and replacement and things like that but in terms of green spaces we now have control so we would sit and we would wait and hope that maybe once me if we were really lucky twice a year a county council guy would turn up on a lawnmower and cut our um, grass verges so we now some of the verges that need it we cut five six times a year we can react to weather we can react to um, conditions and uh, safety issues in terms of highway and we have much greater control but what that's also given us is uh, greater flexibility over the management of all of our green spaces and um, so now we can control the timing so if we have a really early summer like we have had this year then we can cut the grass earlier if we um, if we have as we are having at the moment huge rainstorms and then a, a week of sunshine and all the green spaces go absolutely mad we're not left for kind of three months waiting for someone to come and manage them we can also make crucial decisions about how we manage those spaces so uh, we will always have parts of the town like the park which has high traffic of residents, that they want it to look manicured, they want it to look well tended, they want it neat and tidy. But what we're finding is there is a greater demand for more natural spaces. And with more natural spaces comes greater scope for uh, increased biodiversity and creating those stepping stones and those green corridors through our town that link to the green belt that surround us. Um, so some of, some of the issues have been managing the internal change. We've just completed um, town eco audit of all the council's operations. And it's been, it's been quite an eye opener, I think, for our own staff and getting them to develop new ways of thinking around green spaces and looking at them very differently. Um, staff development, we've, we've undergone some training in-house uh, so that 
our parks team in particular have learnt new land management methods so that's been really positive and they're now much more keen to develop more natural habitats and increase biodiversity. Um, one thing I would say at this point is that does not mean they get to do less work and we as a council spend a lot less money because sometimes uh, they may be very natural spaces but they actually do take some some uh, more detailed management so things like ragwort needs to be put out pulled out of wildflower areas and they can be a little bit more time intensive but it is worth it um, also changing regimes and um, one little bonus that we didn't expect as we've developed our parks team we are surrounded by smaller parish councils we are now monetizing our services because smaller we, we appreciate smaller parish councils don't have the manpower the equipment in-house and therefore as a large team Town, a large parish council we um, we almost uh, feel an obligation to help our neighboring villages you know the people who come into our town shop in our town they live in our town we may have a town boundary but we certainly you know it, it doesn't stop that flow of of people as well as kind of the natural space and and uh, and creatures and hedgehogs and everyone else um, so actually now we are providing a service to our parishes so as local parishes it's really important to learn what your neighbours are doing because there is greater scope for collaboration um, resident input is really important uh, we've always said communicate collaborate and educate um, which is another big mouthful but it's really important to tell people what you're doing so they understand uh, you will be amazed at how many residents will want to come out and help and we've certainly seen a massive increase in the last year or two with all of the interest around climate change um, and many more residents now want to get involved they appreciate the health benefits they're very concerned about how we look after our natural spaces um, also i am always terrified by how knowledgeable our residents are um, and he's quite right you will have local uh, experts so we have a local natural history society uh, we've got a couple Couple of retirees from the Environment Agency who've been invaluable, who come and volunteer and give us some expert guidance, give us a nudge when we're doing it a little bit wrong. But we would be lost without them. So do reach out to your communities because that's really important. Um, and educate, you know, um, uh, it's quite funny. I have two 19 year old girls and actually they educate me. They are so much more knowledgeable about the environment and biodiversity. And every time I think I know something, they tell me five new facts. But educating your, your, parish residents is really important because the more you educate them the more they will start to think about biodiversity much more naturally as part of their everyday um, kind of activities um, overcoming issues there will always be issues um, I can't emphasize enough do take a bit of time to plan things don't assume you're going to get something done really quickly we always try and plan a year or two ahead if we're um, introducing a new space or trying to improve the biodiversity of a space because it always takes a lot longer than you think um, budget sometimes you can do everything on a, a, on goodwill and collaboration but sometimes you will need to put a little bit of money in um, flexibility is is key it never goes completely according to plan it will rain when you don't want it to and the rain will run out i've been watering 32 trees for the last three months with with water bowsers in the back of my car my husband's not talking to me anymore because i keep dragging him out to help so you have to be a, you have to be flexible and you have to be willing to adapt and, and compromise we have um we now have 13 wildflower verges in chesham we would have 14 but there is one and no matter how much do the community uh, there are a couple of people who will go out and mow that grass and those wildflowers down every couple of weeks because they just want their manicured birch so you have to be flexible and compromise um, as a town uh, being part of the old Chilton and South Bucks local plan area it's a bit uncertain as to what is going to happen with our local plan and even with a local plan coming in as local councillors that you know there are some areas particularly green spaces where we didn't feel it was robust enough so as a town council we have just embarked on starting our own neighborhood plan 
it is a bit of work um, and a lot of people tell you it's very expensive. There's a lot of funding from central government that can be accessed. Uh, there are all kinds of organisations like the NEP and BBOUT that will, will offer guidance and assistance. Um, and there are also a plethora of consultants out there doing good work who are building these neighbourhood plans for a lot of other parish and town councils. So they have them almost written already. So it's just a bit of scoping work land assembly work, a bit of environmental work, and then the final plan can come together quite easily. Uh, so I would encourage you to do it. Um, these these neighbourhood plans sit next to the MPPF, they sit next to local plans, they have as much weight when it comes to planning decisions. So if you really care about your green spaces and biodiversity, uh, a neighbourhood plan can be a really good tool for that fine detail at local level. Um, and trees we're going to have another webinar I think next week in fact talking about um, how we manage uh, verges wildflower meadows and also we now have an urban tree planting um, uh, program where we don't we can't find a big space to plant hundreds of trees but we've already planted 32 within highways verges and within the urban setting and we're being quite aggressive and hoping to plant another hundred this autumn and keep that going and again it's all about community involvement, um, educating our residents, getting them to nominate sites. We've had residents out helping to plant. So there'll be some case studies around what we've been doing in Chesham at a later webinar. And hopefully you will find all of that um, of, of use and of value. And also uh, we've been working with Marlow because they've been doing something similar with urban planting and there's been a lot of sharing of knowledge. So I'm more than happy to share my phone number and email address. So as parish councillors, if you do want a bit of mentor or you've got questions or you just need a little bit of support just to kind of get you going because it can be quite daunting, then more than happy to kind of take questions outside of the webinars. Um, so I've whizzed through really quickly because we are short on time. It's always the joy of being the last one to go, but I'll hand back to Kate now.